Let's talk about a technical issue. What I've just gone through is kind of an overview of how the internet functions. And that high level overview is important for you to understand. That's what establishes the framework that you can hang some additional information onto. So keep that in mind. We have computers. They're all connected to this switching mechanism which can interconnect a given computer to a distant computer by way of an address. Somewhere in between, a communication circuit has to be established between two computers that want to communicate. The way that that circuit is established is the big difference between the traditional telephone switching system and the way that the internet works. And before this discussion concludes, I will show you the very specific reason why the internet was developed in the way that it was, the problem it was trying to solve. First of all, let's take a look at the traditional system. What you see here, these little black symbols on either end, are telephone devices of the old type, a handset that sits in a cradle on a device. What you see in the green boxes are central offices that connect to the telephones through wire lines. So the very first central office that's connected here to a telephone is the local subscriber office, and that's located in the neighborhood. Typically, it's a small brick building, and it doesn't much have windows in it. Uh, it used to have to be bigger than it is now, but what the point of that whole thing is that that's where everybody's telephone in that local area connects to. Now, presumably, this phone wants to talk to somebody far distant, so they're connected at the other end to a central office, but the central offices are connected to bigger offices, and they have bigger communication pipes between them. So you might think everybody's connected to everybody, but not so. This person, this phone, is only connected by a dedicated wire line to here. When this receiver is picked up, something happens over here, and it knows that that line is open. But somebody here puts a number in, the telephone number. And that telephone number somehow has to establish through the mechanism of the phone system a connection between these two. And to hold that connection circuit open, that telephone line is open and the communication circuit is continuous until one or the other party hangs up and breaks that connection. So what happens here when you make a telephone call this way, and by the way, it doesn't really much matter whether this is a landline here or you're out here with a cell phone. Because what happens is, if you have a cell phone, that's just going to a cell phone tower which is going to one of these anyway. The switching that's going to occur through this network pretty much occurs through the traditional telephone system, and that's why at the other end you can reach somebody with a number. Now, it's moving away from that. Some of the carriers are actually replicating this whole thing through the Internet in a far different way. But let's just pretend for the moment that this traditional telephone system is being used. And let's just assume further that this is really a physical instrument that's sitting on somebody's desk or on somebody's wall when they're picking it up the old-fashioned way and dialing with a dedicated landline. So what happens is this. You pick up the receiver and this line, which is turned red, becomes open. You, t you put in a number indicating who you want to reach and that starts the circuit building process. So an open circuit forwarding your call in the forward direction is established. And you know, this office here may choose from the available routes, and it happens to take the one that's available and least used at that moment in time. That next office makes the same decision. It sees where it's coming from and where it's going to, and it builds another chunk of that circuit. And here, dumped into a shared communication high-speed line, high-capacity line, between two major offices in the direction of completing your connection, and the address, that is the telephone number you've entered, is further used there to get down to the local level, and now we have a complete circuit. This circuit is going to be continuous. That is, once established, the other person picks up the phone, now you're talking and you can both talk at the same time and hear each other because communication can occur both ways on this. And it's continuous. If you leave this receiver off and this receiver off, you really are tying up this line continuously. No one else can use the particular channels that you're using at, the, at that time. So that's the way that the traditional phone system worked. Now, in the 1960s, Remember, computers were already coming along, so they could be applied to these kinds of 
situations. Some engineers decided to try and come up with something better using computers to route the signals. It was called packet switching. It envisioned a global computer network and special hardware based on computer circuitry was developed for this. And initially it connected a few universities to the Department of Defense because the Department of Defense issues grants to develop various kinds of technologies and to communicate with the universities. This was something that was seen to be an interesting development. And it had to be more robust than the regular telephone system. We'll see why in just a second. These nodes, as they were called on this early internet, were connected at what we would think is a rather low speed, 56,000 bits per second. That was considered very high speed in that day. If you divide that by eight bits per character, you'll see that it's about 7,000 characters a second, which isn't really very fast by today's standards. Now the way this works is that instead of having a continuous connection, the text that's being sent, initially just ASCII text, it's broken up into groups and each group could follow a separate path through the network. Each packet is separately labeled and sent and they could follow different routes. They're reassembled at the receiving end. Now why was this done? The thing that was done was to try and make this whole network more robust. Now we're looking at these little green boxes here not as part of the traditional phone system, but we're calling them routers. And they exist in various places, sometimes in conjunction with traditional telephone system and sometimes entirely separate facilities. But the idea here was, if this is the communication network, what happens if some parts of it are destroyed? Back in the Cold War, the issue of a nuclear war was uh, very much on people's minds. So if chunks of this network were torn out, how do you maintain some kind of viability between these locations as opposed to just losing communication completely? Now there is some redundancy here. You can see different routes might be taken, but it's not as robust as it would be if you didn't have to maintain a connection continuously from one place to another. With that kind of connection being maintained continuously, any place along that communication circuit that's destroyed and you don't have any communication anymore. You'd have to reestablish some other path. With packet switching, because at the moment that every packet is processed, the available line at that time is the one it's sent along. The network itself is built to be robust so that portions of it can drop out and the other routers will know that and they just won't attempt to use it to send additional packets. So if major portions of the network were removed, it would still function. Obviously, it would have less capacity, but it would still function. Your communication would continue to be continuous even though your connection was not continuous. Let's take a look at how that works. Here we have a message at the left side, and you see it's made up of, let's say, red, blue, and green. I just colored these packets differently so you can see them proceed through the network. So we had established communication. We have an address on it. It's like our initiation of a communication to that server from Kalamazoo. We're communicating to Timbuktu. We've put its URL on this and the first packet is sent out. What's happened there? Well, that first packet hit the first router, that red one, and it was sent in one direction, an available circuit to another router. And meanwhile, another packet, color blue here, is released. Now we've got the, the red one on its way in one direction, and at the split second that the blue packet hit that first router, the best available line was a different one than the red one had traveled, so this one's traveling a different route. And the green packet has been released from the sender. Now it looks like we've gotten farther, but the green packet is following yet a different route through the network and let's follow them through the system farther. Now they reach progressing farther, heading in the direction of the intended recipient, and it's getting there because the URL having been resolved to an IP address is being acted upon by every one of these routers to forward the message in the appropriate direction. So now the packets are progressing through the network and because of traffic and busy here and not busy there, routers being loaded in here, heavily loaded in one place and perhaps not so much in another. And just the speed of the communication lines themselves, 
these packets may wind up reaching this at different times. Now what packet started coming out here first? What packet originated first? This is the way that they came out of the sender. But look at the sequence in which they were received. The blue one got there before the red one. That's entirely possible with packet switching. You might get the chunks of a message coming in a different sequence because of the arrival time being different by perhaps thousands of a second. So at the receiving end, because each packet is numbered, the receiving end has to reassemble them in the proper sequence. You've probably heard about a development called the Magic Jack, which is a way to put your telephone conversations over the internet. It's called voice over IP. That's voice over internet protocol. This is an interesting development. It's actually a technique for sending speech that's been digitized. And you realize from our prior work with Audacity that a sound wave, an analog sound wave, you can chop it up into measurements taken several thousand times a second. And if you send those measurements, the wave can be reconstructed at the receiving end. Because that's a digital signal, that is a digital recording of values, that can be sent through the internet in packets, just as data. And at the receiving end, if those packets are reassembled in the proper sequence, then circuitry can turn that bunch of measurements back into a sound wave just the same way as a portable music player does. The difference is that we don't have to convey so much information, so much, such a frequency range, to make intelligible speech at the other end. So traditionally, filters have been placed on the old telephone system so that frequencies below 300 cycles a second and above 3,000 cycles per second were cut off. They were not processed so that we would have a confined band of, of resource used to get a phone signal from one place to another. And that makes for intelligible speech. But that's why if you play music over a telephone line, just an ordinary telephone line, you really don't have any bass coming through and you don't have much in the way of very high notes because it was not intended to convey high fidelity music. It was intended to convey the human voice. So in any case, what's happening here, that constriction of the amount of frequency range that is carried in telephone conversations actually makes the internet more efficient for carrying voice signals as well. And in fact, fewer measurements are taken per second. A, a uh, proof exists that you have to measure and take these measurements at least twice as frequently as the frequency of the highest pitched sound that you want to convey. So in fact, what's happening here is that the telephone system measures the intensity of the wave 8,000 times a second. For voice communication to digitize it, we don't take measurements 44,000 times a second as, has happened, uh, as happens with CDs to produce high fidelity music reproduction. With 44,000 cycles a second, theoretically, you could replicate accurately waves of up to 22,000 cycles per second, which is way above the normal range of human hearing by a few thousand cycles per second. In fact, most of us can't hear anywhere near that high uh, note, but the CD recording mechanism was intended to produce high fidelity music. When you only measure the sound wave 8,000 times a second, you really can't do much in terms of reconstructing waves accurately above 4,000 cycles a second, which is plenty of capacity for the kind of signal that the voice network was intended to convey. Let's take a look at that. Supposing I've broken my phone conversation, that is my sound file, up into little packets of a few thousand characters. Blah, 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 blah. So every one of those packets might account for a fraction of a second of a conversation. But what would happen if those packets, some of them were lost, which would require a retransmission, which would mean that packet would be slower in being received than it would otherwise be. So if the packets come in out of sequence, well, that's kind of a problem. Because if they were presented in that sequence, your phone call would kind of not make sense. It's as if you chopped up an email into pieces and then you didn't put the pieces in the right sequence at the receiving end. 
you know, it'd be kind of jumbled up. Well, the browser and the transmission mechanism can take its time with an email because there's plenty of time to reassemble it and then it becomes available for you to read. But with something occurring in real time, like a telephone conversation, if the packets are, some of them are lost, then it makes no sense to delay the entire sound, the entire conversation. What happens is it drops out, and I'm sure you've noticed that at a time because some of your, uh, some portion of your cell phone conversations are carried in this way. In fact, major, major portions are carried in exactly this way. That even when you speak into the phone, the digital signal on newer phones is being conveyed to the network. And if something affects packets, some signal level drops, you notice these dropouts. It gets to sound kind of broken up. You're breaking up. That's what it actually means, that some of the packets are not being received in time, so they can't be reinserted. They're just thrown away. And those gaps are what result in the choppiness of, of breaking up telephone conversations. Well, in any case, now that we have an idea of how that communication mechanism occurs, in other words, packet switching, that's what it means. By the way, as a practical matter, that'll be something you better have a good understanding of for the final exam. I'll give you a tip right there. One of the questions will probably be, uh, is describe the difference between the traditional telephone switching mechanism and packet switching. And why was the internet developed this way? To make the entire communication mechanism more robust in case chunks of it were destroyed, put out of service, either with a nuclear disaster or some other type of, a, of an event, an act of God that wipes out certain parts of the country with earthquakes or some other natural event, that the communication mechanism would still function. It would degrade in terms of capacity, but it would still continue to function without a stop, as opposed to the kind of thing that would happen with traditional phone switching. You would lose communication entirely between some established communication paths and it would be a much bigger mess to try and deal with the reestablished communication.